That is not a customer centric term. Would, would a customer in the room feel like they would want to be deflected? Mm -hmm. They might feel deflated. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Eagle, the host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders looking to drive improvement in their CX and culture together. I'm really excited to be here today with uh, Mark, who's the uh, founder of EmpoweredCX.com, and he's the, um, the creator of the Trusted Guy Masterclass, which he'll tell you a little bit more about, and he also has a, a top-rated podcast, the Delighted Customers podcast. So uh, thanks for being on the other side of the microphone today, Mark. Matt, thanks so much for having me. It's just going to be fun. I appreciate you having me on the show. So I guess just to get us uh, started, I mean, you have a, a really interesting background um, and you're uh, one of the, cre you know, the, the, the creators and contributors to the first ever um, master's program in CX, the uh, Master's in Experience Man Management at MSU. Could you tell us a little bit about that journey of how you got involved there in addition to all the other things that you're doing? <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, thanks for asking. Uh, yeah, the MSU Master's degree, for those who don't know, is the first ever of its kind in North America. It's the first degree program in just CXM. And uh, I started a relationship with Tom DeWitt, who's, uh, who's running that program and started and had the vision for it. And over time, he was looking to to fill his faculty. And um, like anybody else, I applied for the position. There were a lot of applicants. Uh, and somehow I got selected to be part of that group. There's 15 of us, it's two people, two people, full time professors, and the rest are practitioners uh, or former practitioners who have who have been or are currently uh, leading CX in some form or fashion. So they have real world experience and that to me makes it unique and, and we communicate. So the faculty gets together on a regular basis. We link our classes together and, um, and that's how we got, that's how we got started on this thing. And now, now there's four cohorts, cohorts, cause I go through as a group in 20 months. Um, and the first class graduated in April this year. Congratulations. One of the, uh, uh, another one of the faculty members was on the podcast earlier, Lee Carbone. Oh, well, yeah, Lou's, Lou's a CX icon, legendary, and, you know, wrote, clued in and really is responsible for coining customer experience. A lot of people give him credit. He's the most modest guy you ever want to meet, but he's one of my favorite people. He's a great guy. I've always enjoyed teaming with him on things that touch on unconscious thought. Yeah. Uh, like when I was at um, PwC, we would do work together with clients where we wanted to understand the deep metaphors at clients and um, like what, how do you drive um, clue consciousness in the employees? Yeah. Yeah. Really good stuff. I know he spends a lot of time in that and he came from the advertising world and did work with Disney and fun places like that. He is uh, special. And I think there's a lot to be said about what the decisions that get made subconsciously are really underestimated by a lot of people. Yeah. Well, a lot of the conversations, um, uh, maybe it's a bit of a hammer in search of a nail on some of these things, but a lot of the conversations I have, I feel like uh, do touch on the importance of emotion and, and, and both in consumer behavior and organizational behavior. And you, you actually put a big emphasis on trust, which I feel is connected, you know, about, you know, how, how to, you know, in, in a, particularly in the B2B construct you have relationships with people you trust them and it links into the emotion and the same is true with consumers love to get your your thoughts about you know how you focused on trust what does that mean and, and i'm sure you'll tell us more about the master class that you do yeah I, I agree with you 100 percent um it, it came to me a while ago if you can think about it like a wine glass right being like a container and the more trust you have, the larger the wine glass. So pour yourself a nice Cabernet or Merlot, whatever you like to drink. Um, the, the value is what goes in that glass. Um, but the bigger the glass, the more value. And, uh, and I think, you know, so it's important to understand what trust is. And that's, that's a $64,000 question because um, there's so many definitions of trust. 
Uh, and so how can you become a master or master what trust is and become good at it if, if you can't get a common definition of it? So I, we have used, because of my background, at one point uh, in a prior life, I was part of Trusted Advisor Associates and worked on Charlie Green's team, who co-authored the Trusted Advisor book. Um, and the model there is called the trust equation. And we use that in the Trusted Guide Roadmap Masterclass as a basis for CX leaders who want to make change but struggle. They get frustrated because they've hit a wall for various reasons and they're not getting the buy in either at the executive level or other stakeholders. So um, the model that we use uh, is based on four variables. One is called credibility, and uh, that is that is a focus around your words, your honesty, do you have the white jacket? You can imagine the white jacket of a medical professional or the uniform of a pest control person. You know, you've got some credibility there. Um, it's the diploma on the wall, the, those things. But also like how confident you are and you come across as your handshake firm. That's credibility. And then reliability, which is do you follow through on your promises? Really simple. The, the third one is intimacy, and here's where you start to get into the emotional piece of it, as you mentioned, Matt. Um, and that's a weird word. It's kind of a provocative word for in a business environment, especially B2B, is intimacy. But they chose it on purpose because it, the idea is that there's a certain safe haven for difficult conversations, right? a place where you can go, there's a vault. There's a place where you can go where the person knows how to react when you say something, to laugh or to cry or just to say, mm, ouch, that must hurt. You know, that's a level of empathy uh, and understanding that, that that's called intimacy. And it's the person that you feel comfortable going to, thus the book called The Trusted Advisor, where you can share not just business issues, but sometimes it gets into more personal issues that underlie the business issues. And then all that's in a numerator, credibility, reliability, and intimacy, all over the denominator, which is self-orientation. And that's in the denominator because it works in an inverse relationship to trustworthiness, which is really what we're solving for. I, I said the word trust, but really it's it's trustworthiness, the person who wants to be trusted. And, and I think about it both in terms of the CX leader trying to make the change in an organization, but also the company. The company wants to be trusted by its customers. Um, and so self-orientation is what it sounds like. It is really, where's my focus? Is it on you and serving you and delivering a great experience for you? Or is it on myself? Uh, and typically, you know, we think about the used car salesman and just someone just trying to make a commission. But it's really more subtle than that at times. It's me being overly focused on my nerves or what I'm going to say next and not thinking about, you know, being fully present for you but I'm focused on myself. So that's, that's the model. And then you get into the application of it, uh, both for personal first and then for professional or business businesses second. So as a CX leader, CX leaders need to collaborate with others in the organization. They want to be change agents in the organization. They need to build trust of others internally within the organization to have impact. And then they also need to build trust with customers to be able to have impact on CX. So both, both aspects of trust, internal and external, are really important, it sounds like. They really are. And, uh, and, and the question is, you know, first, you have to understand what it is and what the definitions are. And then second is, okay, what's a good way for me to, to develop this in a strategic way? And I don't mean that to sound sterile, but thinking about it proactively, thinking about it. Because when you start to think about your role as a change leader, not just as someone who's doing surveys, who's doing journey maps, who's doing all these different activities, right? But you're a change leader, then it should change your mindset and have you rethink about what your role is, which is much more longer term, much more strategic. How do I build trust with, as you mentioned, key stakeholders in the organization? What are the things that motivate them? What are the things that are underlying the surface? As we talked about, to, yeah, you were in the in the breakout session we had in Denver, they talked about how to become a guide versus a hero. They don't, they don't want another hero. They've got enough heroes. Um, but they might be open to a guide who can help them achieve their goals. And so there's these levels of goals. We talk about the external the internal, and then the philosophical, which is the way things they believe, the way things ought to be. And when you blend those three together, and I hope I'm not throwing too much at you, um, 
here is there's a villain. There's a villain in this story for them. Wh- who, what is the villain? The villain could be the, the darn technology needs to move quicker. Or why can't we beat our competitor? Or why can't, we, why can't more people act the way Matt does when he's serving on the front line? You know, and it's not something necessarily we turn into a publicity thing. It's, but for you as a CX leader to make change, to build those relationships, you need to go to those levels of understanding, in my opinion, if you want to make the change that is required because people are resistant to change. I really liked um, the session that you did in Denver at CXP Advance on the connecting trust to the hero's journey and be the guide, not the hero. And, um, you know, I know that was just a, a sampling of what you could experience with the trusted guide masterclass. And you, you have one coming up, I understand in, in, uh, in, uh, beginning of June, do you want to share a little bit more about like what the masterclass is and, and what, what's involved? Sure. Well, thank you um, for the opportunity. Yeah, the, the next one is June 5th, uh, and I'm excited about it. We've got some pretty, uh, pretty cool people going to be joining us. And I hope if you, if you are a CX leader who's interested in leveling, leveling up your game and having some struggles or frustration and, and already kind of understand the basics, it's for you. Um, we, we cover some some of the things that I think are issues for CX leaders, starting with what we just talked about, which is trust. So how do you earn trust and what does it mean? Why is it a big deal? How do you then become a guide and what are some practical applications of, of how you can become strategically uh, successful in becoming a guide? The third one is building out a roadmap. So many, many CX leaders don't have a roadmap that's shareable. That is that is built on consensus. That is that uh, enlists the support of a, co- a guiding coalition, right, of people. So we help you develop this roadmap. And then the fourth thing is proving the value. So I don't use the word ROI, but R- there are five ROI models in there uh, to help help leaders understand and think about the conversations they're going to have with the executive team. In their and speak in their language, so that that's really what it's based on. I like to say myself, Mark, that there's three journeys that matter. Um, and I and when I think about like um, Journey Spark, the name of my company, it's about sparking energy and innovation along all three of these journeys. It's an intentional layered metaphor. Uh, what you're saying really resonates with me because I think it's you, what you're talking about being a guide. There's actually a, the company's on a journey too not just the customer. So a lot of the emphasis in customer experience is on the customer journey, which is important. And and what are the moments that matter in the customer journey and the peak emotions and and how do you curate those experiences along the customer journey? It's awesome to focus on that and be customer driven. But there's two other journeys that matter equally. One is the journey your company's on to be aware of like, where are you on the journey? What's your roadmap? Where are you going? How, how, what do you need to do to get there? So like your masterclass helps leaders be guides of their companies on that journey. And the third journey is the employee journey. The employees are actually on a journey of self-discovery at a like micro level versus the macro of their company. And you can be intentional as a company about helping your employees go on that journey, not just the leaders, but everyone in the company, whether it's the skills, mindsets, behaviors, the relationship networks, how do you help your employees contribute to CX? Yeah, I, I love what you just said. I really like those three kind of circles. I imagine a Venn diagram. Uh, of those three together because they're all they're all critical and I think you hit the nail on the head head there so that's that's I'm in complete alignment with your thinking yeah that's why my logo was interlocking circles ah there you go I yeah. I should have I should have put two and two together I should it's the uh, <laughs> the design the designer and both of us we're we're you know um, so, uh, thank you for sharing that. I, I think it was a really good experience to go through at Denver and I'm sure people, the audience would get a lot of value out of the, the masterclass. Um, and I'd like to come back to this, um, the trust angle, how does trust differ 
in a B2B setting versus consumer setting? How do you think about consumer versus B2B trust? That's a great question. I think um, in, a co- in a couple of different ways. So if you start with the trust equation that I just talked about and those variables, the trust equation was designed for a personal or individual assessment of trust. How trustworthy am I? To, a, to an extent, it translates uh, to companies, but people really don't have the same kind of trust with a company because it's an institution. <clears throat> but some of, the, some of the motivations behind the four variables still apply, right? <clears throat> do I trust from the sense of are they, are they um, do they have the credibility? This, we, now we talk about social proof. Um, is it a brand that I, that I n- have heard of before? Uh, what am I hearing from my neighbors, word of mouth, uh, reliability, um, you know, do they follow through on, does a brand follow through on what it says it's going to, those things are pretty easy. The, the hard part is really the intimacy and the self-orientation. And even then, sometimes as, as we go into this world of AI, we can personalize things, you know, and to the extent we can make it about them and not about what we're selling, but hey, I noticed last time, you know, number one, you wear a size nine shoe that's a D width that, you know, has leather or white in color. I've got a recommendation for you from people like you. And this is what Amazon's been doing a while. But that's just one example of not serving up irrelevant offerings to you, but giving you what you want. And and if you think about the omni-channel experience, right? There's another, I want to, I want to be able to interact with you when, how where I want. And I also want you to know that if I did something on via text or called in, that you already know that. I, you know that the left hand knows what the right hand's doing, right? And you know, you know my relationship with you. You know that I've been with you X number of years. You know what products or services I've purchased, what, where I've clicked on your website. Um, so that's, that's where I think the intersection. And so as you, as you get into B2B, it's harder, it's gonna, it's hopefully will get easier, but it's harder to get your, get your arms around the relationship because there's often different tentacles involved in B2B, often multiple people interacting with your company who are, who are buying or interacting. You've got a decision maker, you could have multiple user people you've got. So you've got, it's harder to get your arms around that. Not impossible. Um, trust is important in both areas. And so that's the way I think about it is it may take a little more work in B2B to understand, but it's no less important. What you got me thinking about, Mark, um, is that in a, in a B2B setting, a lot of companies, you know, they build relationships I'm doing like a then versus now, like you know, a lot of companies historically have built relationships, with people, human to human relationships, sales and service, they build trust, they build they, all the reasons you mentioned from human to human effective relationships in the company. And then they're also trying to reinforce their expertise in the market, their credibility in the market. So what's happened is their human humans have delivered that and reinforced that connection. And now we have content marketing and we have digital and we have all these things which are trying to replicate what was there in the human relationship in a digital means, a fidgetal way. It's both because it's not 100% digital in B2B usually, um, very rarely, right? Um, and, uh, and you're trying to replicate some of the benefits of a human to human through the digital experience and it's actually hard to do. The AI is getting better at enabling you to have content that's tailored and personalized and you're able to mine and listen to it. And, and, but that's what companies are really working on with a customer experience is trying to reinforce that in, in digital. Anyway, I started on digital transformation and migrated to customer experience over my career, you know, is, uh, and I kind of realized I was a CX guy because like all the digital stuff was actually experience. And I realized you couldn't have an impact on the digital without touching the physical, whether it was retail or hospitality or financial or health, it was, they're both critical. So I kind of realized I was no longer a digital transformation guy. I was an experienced guy. 
Uh, and so what you're saying really resonates that you building that trust is about, you know, go through both digital and physical reinforcing what used to be more personal, but like effectiveness for personal and replicating it through the whole experience. Right. <clears throat> That's 100% right. And it's understanding, you know, what's important to the customers, to your best customers in particular, that what are their loyalty drivers? What are the things that matter most? And AI, you know, I think often terms I've heard the the phrase, you know, is it technology in search of a strategy? Um, or is a strategy that that's using technology to make the experience better? And so you always have to start with what is it our customers, our best customers want? First, you got to know who your customer is. What's your best customer? This is what I teach at Michigan State is, is um, we're, the, the course is called customer relationship management, but it's not CRM as we thought about like salesforce.com. It's a holistic view of what's the relationship that we want to have with our customer, which customers, and it starts with which customers do we want to have relationships with? Do we even understand the definition? At the bank I work for, it took us years to get a uh, level set on an agreement of what actually is a customer. What are we going to define as a customer? And when we're measuring things, particularly things around CX, what are, what are the things we want to we wanna pull out of the pool? Uh, for example, online only, right? So if there's no account open and they have an on online relationship, they're not a customer. There could be two, th because we have to keep them on the books for a year after they leave because of fe federal mandates, regulations, they're still, they're still there, but they're not an active customer because they don't, have, they have a zero balance in all their accounts. So you've got, you, you've got to understand who your customers are, what's, what your best customers are, and then what loyalty drivers are. How can then I build trust best with that customer set? So you open the door on AI. We have remarkable restraint that we got this far in the conversation <laughs> before we talked about Agreed. AI, but we talked about some arguably more important things about leadership and um, how do you how do you show up as a leader and 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 focus on the customer and drive the right behaviors? All the things that you were talking about related to trust. I think we're about culture and how do you drive leadership and change. Um, but now that we're talking about AI, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts about how is um, how is AI impacting the, the the practice? You know, is it is it because of the way we build insights? Is it the way we build automation? Is it the way we deliver an experience? Like, what what is it that about AI that is most promising if done well? I, obviously, it's all the above, um, and every every company needs to prioritize which projects or initiatives to do first because you can't boil the ocean but it's you know at the end of the day it's how do you how do you what are the things that are going to drive your growth engine as an organization what are the things if you think about it profitability equals revenue minus cost so to the extent that you can increase revenue decrease cost and there's this other thing or you, a couple of other things one in particular that's near and dear to the c-suite these days is risk right corporate organizational risk what can you do to re reduce or control stabilize risk um, and obviously all these things have impact on culture uh, so what can you do to take away the non-value added work from workers who don't like that particular kind of work by using ai what can you do to serve up information for them so that they can help their customers better in a way that we could never do before. Um, you know, we talked about omni-channel. Where can you shift to channels that are less expensive when it doesn't really negatively impact, in some cases actually positively impacts the customer. Um, and I'll give you one other example specific and then I'll stop rambling here. But I love this story. I had um, a guy named Andy Cockburn from the UK from Mention, a company called Mention Me. And what they do is they uh, track and measure influencers, basically influencers. So these are people who either cust small customers, big customers, or even not really customers who have made referrals to people and they track sort of like a spider web all the way down the line of the people that all these connections, and they have actually a visualization of this web 
of people. And the example that Andy shared on, on my show um, was that this woman, so it's a UK, it's a European largest florist in the, in the Europe and they operate in the UK. And this woman who uh, ordered $258 of flowers over a year disappeared. She went away. She's no longer a customer. They went and did this tracking of her using AI. We just talked about in this world of referrals, which is a huge opportunity in my opinion, and found that she was she only spent two hundred fifty eight dollars. She was responsible for over one hundred fifty thousand dollars in business in referral business. So the question he asked is, what would we have done had we known that to keep her business? Like you could spend, you could make the argument. I spent an awful lot of money trying to save that customer. And so they have figured out a systematic way to engage, attract those people who are not only loyalists, but are advocates of your brand. I find in, um, I'm going to take a slight pivot here, that um, a lot of times when companies do personas, they don't think enough about how do you predict what persona someone will be in earlier in their relationship with you? And they also don't do enough to track personas as they engage with the company to build ongoing insights. So it, it doesn't become a one-off exercise, like a, a report. And I, I, I find one thing that's really powerful when you build personas is to actually make it data-driven where you think about um, you know, often I, I can think of like a two by two where there's, uh, you can't get the consultant out of me. I think of the two by twos all the time, right? That one axis is like the, the revenue potential and another is the cost to serve, right? And the ideal customer would be in that top right quadrant, right? They're high revenue potential, low cost to serve. If you make the axis for cost to serve inverted, um, and you can actually plot customers on this two by two and draw a circle around them and start understanding like what, how do they cluster across a number of variables? And what's really useful is to think about what predicts the revenue potential and spot them early on in their, in their customer um, cycle with you. So the ability to say, oh, so-and-so is this high potential customer and we have this data that shows it and now let me treat them differently and actually design the experience around people who have that potential. Yeah, I, I I love the way you're thinking about this, and um, just to expand on that, I, it's simpler to use revenue, but I also like the idea of using profit, profitability potential, because it does factor into the cost to serve. But one thing I really love about what you said is this idea of potential, and you know when you think about calculating things like a CLV, um, I think oftentimes the formulas don't include potential, and you can really miss some some important customer uh, opportunities if you don't try to put some number on it it's not going to be perfect i mean we're talking about predictions but it could be close enough for you to make some really smart smart business decisions and and there's actually an opportunity now with a lot of the data science to figure out the attributes about your customers that predict that value and spot them early on. And, and, and then you're, you get higher fidelity of which persona someone falls into over time. You might only have 60% up front, but then it goes up over time. It is. And hopefully people are listening to what you're saying and thinking about how to use AI the right way. And I think a lot of the AI initially was fell into two camps. One was automation and summarization and, and we're taking work out. So think of like saving that two minutes at the end of a call center interaction about resolution and actioning or, you know, summarizing a meeting, or this is something that saves time, right? With using AI and, and large language models and, and machine learning. Uh, and there's a lot of applications that started in the call centers that are starting to move into other parts of the CX now, like sales and service. Um, like automatically drafting emails for people or things like that. So we have to save them time. Can I just interrupt you with just one sec? Hold your thought. But I, I, coming from banking world, you use the word sales and service. And that's a, that's a, and it's not something you came up with. It was there when I got, I don't know, 15 years ago. And it was, and I found it across the banking world. And I don't like those coupled together the way they are. I don't think that that's a customer friendly. I don't think my customers want to hear sales and service in the same sentence right? They're two different things. And sales really is a company-centric term. 
Um, and service should be a customer centric term. And it's legacy banking. I don't know if it's in other industries, but that's where I found it. So I just want to call that out because I think the way we talk about, you talk about culture, the way we talk about our departments and the functions within our organization matter. You 100% agree. I think you're spot on, Mark, that like I was using it in the sense of the functions in a business, like marketing, sales, service, HR, IT, uh, you know, supply chain, like operations. Like that tends to be a company out way of looking at the world, but a lot of CX is either has a service orientation or a sales orientation or a marketing orientation versus a customer orientation, which actually, when you build a customer journey, it's not a marketing lens or a service lens. So those functions may show up more in a particular part of the journey, but you need the whole company. Yeah. Well said. You can't. Yeah. So thank you for stopping me there. I, I do think you're right that what you're highlighting is, you know, a lot of the best opportunities to use AI will be cross-functional, pooling the data, pooling the insights, as opposed to solving a specific functional challenge at one portion of the journey for one function. Uh, what I also really love about AI now is it allows you to, um, to increase the velocity of improving the experiences. Like when you talked about a lot about personalization and intimacy, but what used to take a long time where you would do it, you build the insights and then you create the creative and you launch the campaign or change the website. And then six months later you analyze it. Now it's happening real time or new real time with a lot of machine learning and optimization of next best content where, and what's really cool is the, the experience is itself a source of insights. You can mine what's happening in that experience really rapidly. So the question that I have based on all of this improvement in AI is will customers perceive their experiences getting better over, over the years? Will, will all of this wonderful magic formula potions that's involved in AI, will, will customers end up saying, this is a better experience for me? I think too often the answer is no. Because a lot of, if the company, you know, you started off saying, what is the roadmap? What's the vision? What are you trying to do to create value for the customer, not just for yourself? Um, and if all you're trying to do is automate effort out of the journey, if, it, you know, like a lot of digital work is like digital containment. Let me reduce the amount of human interaction needed. Let me make sure it's a hundred percent digital experience. Well, that, unless you design it to create an emotional impact, what you're actually going to do is reduce effort in and retake the emotional joy and other positive emotions out of the experience. <laughs> I, I, I had a, a, a student in my class this past week talk about, use this word, and they work for a large national uh, technology company. And uh, the word was the senior leadership is, has a goal for deflection. They want to Im improve the deflection percentage. And, I, and then they explained what that meant was moving, basically moving customers to lower cost channels. And I thought, you know, I stopped them just like I stopped you in the conversation. Like, that is not a customer centric term. Would, would a customer in the room feel like they would want to be deflected? Mm -hmm. They might feel deflated. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, look, it, it's, you know, working on digital transformation efforts. I saw a lot of, um, outcome measures focusing on cost related metrics and don't get me wrong. Like cost can be an important metric, particularly if it makes your investments self-funding. If you actually are saving on research and testing or saving on vendor spend, or you improve the cost of quality for first time issue resolution, those are savings you can invest in a better experience and drop to the bottom line, you know, and, but, but if all you do is deflection, you're going to end up with a met experience. Right. And in the long run, that'll come back to bite you. hundred percent. And you won't have trust and you won't have a brand. And surprise, surprise, you will have eroded your equity over time. There you go. And, you know, sometimes it, it takes a while to figure out what went wrong. A lot of what you're touching on is actually about leadership and change. As opposed, you know, it's not, it's not just, certainly not focused on technology or analytics. Those are a means to an end. 
and a lot of your 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 expertise is really driving change. So helping leaders be better guides, better change agents. What do you see as some of the lessons learned for CX leaders, you know, to focus on for this CX and culture connection that we've been talking about? I think the I think it's hard to not say those two is is one, how can I become more trustworthy as someone who wants to make change? Recognizing first that change is hard, that, you know, I came from the banking world. No, bankers don't like change at all. <laughs> they don't not, they do not like, and if you're in an industry that, that uh, is somewhat like that, that is reluctant, but even, even if not human nature, people don't like change. And even those people I've found in this world today who do like change feels like it's overwhelming. It's, it's coming too fast, too much. The expectations are too high. So you have to acknowledge, you have to know that change is hard. Your job is especially hard. And typically CX leaders, Matt, have small budgets, limited size teams, and no positional authority. Um, and so everything they have to accomplish is through influence. And that rhymes with trust. Right. And so the idea of being a guide versus a hero of thinking about it long term of figuring out how I can get deeper, better relationships, relationships with people who are key stakeholders who are going to be, you know, um, instrumental in the change that needs to happen. It's not just at the C-suite. I, I say executive buy-in, but the truth is it's not just there. You can get executive buy-in. And if the, the mid-level management isn't on your team, you're in trouble. You know, and so the, just to finish the thought, so then the idea there is you need to have a plan. You need to have a well thought out plan that understands where we where we are today, where we want to go, where the gaps are, and how to how to put that into a roadmap. And then finally is this idea of speaking the language of the C suite is converting the way we output or communicate with the C suite in a language they understand, which we heard a million times in Denver at the leaders advance, but can't really say it enough. And, and the, the reason it's, it's in the course is, and I, I feel like CX leaders have getting banged over the head with this an awful lot. But the fact is that very few CX leaders that I've met came out of school with a finance degree or an accounting degree. There's a couple, but most people don't understand cash flow statements, income statements, balance sheets, and how they work in the language of their organization. It's something they need to take some time to learn. They don't have to be experts, but they need to understand the basics and fundamentals of how to speak that language. The same thing I think is true marketing more broadly, not just in the CX world, but you know, a lot of CX people, um, forgive me for going back to functional orientation, but a lot of CX people have a center of gravity in marketing touching sales and service also, but they want to have this holistic view. And one point of the challenges, you know, the old expression, the marketing is from Venus and finance is from Mars, right? Um, and that the, basically a lot of people in marketing don't speak the same way in the C-suite that the CFO and COO do. And they need to learn to engage people and meet them where they are and use the right language. Yeah, it's it's true. You know, nowadays you have CISOs, you have chief information security officers, you auditors, PMO offices, you, all the all these other departments have to do the same thing. Um, doesn't get us off the hook as CX leaders, though. So NPS is useful, but it's not going to solve that problem. You know, you need a, a broader set of measurement. You need to connect it to the business outcomes. You need other metrics beyond NPS and. Um, you know, I think that what you're highlighting is build the, build the insights in a way that's more holistic, that connects with the stakeholders. Ex exactly. Yeah. Well said. Well, I know that if people want to get more insights on this, the number one thing they should do is go to your masterclass, um, in the beginning of June, maybe you could share some more information and it'll magically appear on screen of where they can, uh, find some stuff about that. But is there anything else, um, did you want to share about how people can get in touch with you or things that you would recommend they do coming out of this podcast? Yeah. So thanks, Matt. The uh, best way to get in touch and learn about the course is uh, visit the website. It's, it's the homepage now. It's www.empoweredcx.com. Let's go there. Um, I also do host a podcast called the Delighted Customers Podcast, and it is designed for people in the customer experience world. 
or we have other people who listen as well, but that's who it's designed for. And, um, and you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Mark, it's been a pleasure talking as always. And, um, I know you sparked a lot of great ideas for me and I am sure for the audience as well. So, um, thanks for taking the time today. Thanks for having me on the show. It was a pleasure. 